is Tipinogos Park near Provo, Utah. It's a spectacularly beautiful place. A place where someone who believes that they can speak directly to God might want to come and have a conversation. Phalene Grant believed that she could speak to God. She had visions, she heard angels. She also predicted her own death, or was it murder? Either way, what happened here was very important, and we're going to tell you why in just a few moments. But until then, we want you to set aside all the assumptions about right and wrong, guilt or innocence, and follow a murder case from Gilbert, Arizona to the Celestial Kingdom. spirit siblings and welcome back to Outer Darkness. The case we're going to talk about today is a case that is eerily similar to Tammy Daybell. I can't actually take credit for the idea. I had a subscriber in December mention this case to me and so I put it on my list of cases that I wanted to look at. Finally was able to get to it. This case was really interesting to read about. One, because it reminded me so much of Tammy Daybell and two, because there were so many factors involved and family relationships and different conflicting stories and views. And then there was the actual evidence that also told its own story. So it is actually one of those cases where I don't know you guys. I'm going to present both sides and you can make your own decision. I don't want to sway you one way or another, but I just, I, this, I don't know about this one. You know, I thought I was going into this and it was going to be cut and dry. It was going to be like a Chad Tammy situation. And I was going to be like, yeah, he definitely did it. But as I read more and more about Faylene's religious beliefs, her journal entries, her farewell letters to her family a few weeks before her death, and then the court documents, I was like, I don't know. Faylene Grant was born on December 31st, 1965 and grew up in a very devout Mormon family. Her mother describes her as someone that would just light up the room, just very kind, very faithful. In an interview, her sister described her as being very Christ-like, which that actually, for the first time, kind of struck me. And I'm curious to know, those of you that practice other religions, if it's common in those religions to try and compare yourself to Christ. Like, I never thought that was weird until I listened to that interview, and I was like, do other, do people in other religions talk about being Christ-like? And is that offensive to other religions? I'm just curious because it's something that is very much part of the terminology in the Mormon churches. You want to strive to be Christ-like. Anyway, Faylene was known for writing little notes to her family and friends and just kind of leaving them everywhere. Very uplifting to them. Faylene also visited the temple frequently for guidance. She was, of course, very active in the Mormon church. And like many other Mormons, she talked about getting premonitions, visions, prophecies, nothing on the Julie Rowe type of level, okay? She was nowhere near that. In my opinion, she sounded like a typical member of the Mormon church. She also had somewhat of a darker side. Doug's sister, Tammy, talked about a time when she went to visit Faylene and the children answered the door and said their mom was sleeping. She brought it up to Doug after this visit and he confirmed that, yes, she did suffer from depression but refused to take any type of medication for it. Off and on for several years in her journals, she had occasionally talked about being depressed. Several months before her death, however, feelings of dying became much stronger with each passing entry. Faylene truly believed that she was going to die young. She claimed that she had visions or some type of prophecies, spiritual experiences that told her that she was not going to be alive for very much longer. But she did frequently in the months before she died. She talked about fulfilling a mission on the other side of the veil, details about her death, planning a funeral, things like that. So there was definitely a side of Faylene that, in my opinion, was preoccupied with her death. Like many Mormon women, Faylene married very young and had two children with her first husband. She later divorced her first husband she had been to the temple and got a feeling that she needed to do that. It's not uncommon for people to go to the temple to seek answers and inspiration when they are questioning things in their life. And it is not unheard of for people to tell you that they had an experience in the temple that helped them decide what they wanted to do. That was completely normal growing up. 
I don't know how it sounds to people that have never been members of the Mormon Church. In fact, you can listen to conference and they repeat it over and over about how the Holy Ghost can guide you to make decisions. A little problematic in some cases. In 1993, Faylene and Doug met at a local gym. Faylene had her two children and Doug had a child from his first marriage. Doug Grant grew up in a small town. He became a nutritionist for the Phoenix Suns and owned a very successful nutritional supplement company, which is so unsurprising to hear. Vitamins, supplements, MLMs, typical. But Doug had become very successful. In fact, in an interview, he explained that his company in a year and a half went from $30,000 a month to over a million dollars a month. And I was like, I'd be okay with the $30,000. Like we could stop there and I'd be like super thrilled. So Faleen and Doug owned this wellness company together. They had two sons and were living in a 2200 square foot home in Gilbert, Arizona in the suburbs. And in January of 2000, they were still together for all time and eternity in the Mormon temple as a family, which means the same basically as someone getting sealed without children. It's just then you're sealed all together to be an eternal family. I thought it was strange that they weren't sealed sooner in the marriage, but after going through the case, my assumption, definitely not proven, is that it was possibly because Doug had a little bit of a problem cheating and shit. Can't get a temple recommend when you're a philanderer. In June of 2000, Faileen did file for divorce. So only a few months after they were still together, she claimed it was because she was at the temple and received a witness that Doug was being unfaithful. According to Faileen's sister, Doug admitted to cheating on Faileen with six different women because he's a son of a bitch bastard. He was probably on Ashley Madison's customer of the year list or something like that. He was actually excommunicated while they were apart for having relations with Hillary DeWitt, a 19-year-old receptionist for his company that he had met and fell in love with. So he was brought before a, at the time it would have been called a disciplinary council. Now it's a membership council and tried for excommunicate. Like, I don't know how else to explain it, but that was brought to their attention. They made the decision to excommunicate him. For the most part, it was because he did not stop after they said stop. To me, it sounds like Doug was a little bit of an addict and couldn't keep his Johnson in his pants. Doug had met Hillary in the fall of 2000. So after he and Faleen were divorced, their relationship was pretty serious. In fact, Doug stated in an interview that he was ready to ask Hillary to marry him. Doug and Faleen, because of their commitment to their family, they were relatively friendly after their divorce and got along well. They really put their children first. So while Doug and Hillary were bumping uglies, Faleen was going to the temple. She started talking more and more about these visions of hers and these feelings she would get. Now her family says she never said that God talked to her or that she had seen a vision or that she was prophesying anything. They claim that she would just mention that she would get a feeling. I was only able to read like one journal entry and then I read some entries that were quoted in articles and in the shows that talked about the case. To me, it didn't sound like she would just walk in the room and go, I got a feeling I'm going to die soon. She was very much using typical Mormon terminology. She even mentioned to a friend while Doug and her were apart that she wanted to stop dating someone that she'd become interested in because she was scared that she would leave him a widower. She was was already thinking she was going to die young. This was not a question to her or curiosity. Her journal entries revolved around her belief that she didn't have much time left. In July of 2001, Doug and Faleen traveled to Dallas. They were involved in a lawsuit with their company and so they needed to go resolve that. During that trip, they started talking about the possibility of getting back together even though Doug was dating Hillary. They ended with Faleen saying, you know what, it's going to take a miracle for us to get back together. You know, I'll go to the temple and I'll pray about it. And one thing you have to know is that families in the Mormon church are extremely important. Your eternal salvation involves your family. That is part of the plan of salvation. So it is last resort really to get divorced because when you are sealed to someone in the temple, you are sealed to them eternally. I don't think it's anything that is looked down on as much as it used to be nowadays. Just so many people get divorced. I don't think people are nearly as judgmental. But if you really look at the doctrine and the teachings, you stick together for your family, your families 
eternal salvation relies on your marriage, pretty much. And I know people that really believe that, like if their kid didn't go on a mission or became inactive, that they would be threatened with their eternal salvation. So like maybe they wouldn't be able to go to the celestial kingdom or they raised some kid that left the church or that they would not be able to see their child in the celestial kingdom. So it is a big deal. And I imagine that this was somewhat the motivation for Faelene and Doug to bring it up and start talking about it especially on Faelene's part. She was a single mother. She didn't really want to date from what it sounds like because she was afraid she would leave someone a widower. And I can totally understand wanting to get back together, even if you know in your heart it may not be the best thing. I mean, I did it for a couple years. Anyway, Faelene tells Doug, I'm going to go pray about it in the San Diego temple. And that's where she goes. While Faelene was in the San Diego temple praying about what to do, she claimed that she was told Like I was told, we've heard those words before, and they are very common words to hear. That is why I doubt when Lori Daybell says, I was told when people will talk about how she would say to them, I was told, and they credit it to Chad. Are we sure about that? Because that's such a common phrase. I don't know. It could be, but I'm kind of thinking she meant I was told by God, Jesus Christ, Holy Ghost. I mean, but Chad was a Holy Ghost at one point, so maybe she did mean Chad. So after Faelene is told she needs to get back together with Doug in the temple, she calls calls Doug and tells him this news. He's like, I was just with Hillary boinking. And now you're telling me that you were told in the temple that we need to get back together for the sake of our family. We got to talk about this. So Doug, with his two youngest children, decides he's going to fly out to meet her so they can talk about this. And while they are in Southern California, they actually took the boys to Disneyland. On their way back from California, they were driving near Vegas. I don't know where they got the car because it sounded like they flew there, but I guess that doesn't really matter. Faelene apparently was driving and she missed a turn and she viewed that as a sign that they needed to get married. They had already kind of decided on it, but she was like, we got to get married now. I missed the turn. That means we got to do it. Doug went along with it. He was a willing participant and they ended up pulling into Vegas and getting married at the Excalibur. When they got home, they told their family and friends that they had reconciled and remarried. Naturally, everyone was shocked as shit. Nobody more shocked probably than Hillary. Faelene's family was not thrilled about this decision. They really were not fans of Doug and you can definitely tell in the interviews that they gave and in the court documents. Like they pretty much were like the dude's a scumball. The interesting thing is that her family also claimed that after Doug and Faley were remarried that Doug was kind of a pest and their relationship became strained because they wanted to visit with Faleen without him probably because they thought he was a piece of shit and he was always around. That I thought was interesting because they didn't like him originally because they felt like he wasn't a very good husband, which he wasn't, but that he didn't treat her well and wasn't affectionate with her. And then when they got back together, he was trying to be a better husband and they were like, well, we don't like that either. But you know how it is when one of your friends or like a family member is with someone you don't like, no matter what they do, it's not going to change your opinion. Meanwhile, Tammy, who is Doug's sister and her husband talked about how they thought Faelene and Doug were extremely happy. In fact, the happiest they'd ever been between the two marriages. This is something that continues through the trial. You have two conflicting views. You have the view of Faelene's family and Doug's family, and they are just like oil and water. About a month after they were remarried, Faelene handed Doug a letter, and in the letter she wrote, this has been by far the happiest month as we've been one and committed to being one with our Savior and Heavenly Father. You are my King, and my love is true through the good and bad. I will be with you always. At the same time, Faelene and Hillary had become friends, which is a little, you know, odd. According to Faelene's mother, she was going for sainthood, apparently, and that was just her personality, and I think that Faelene viewed Hillary, who was only 19, as kind of a little prodigy. Like she was kind of like a Mormon mentor. Hillary credited her with returning to the church. She was Mormon, but she was an inactive Mormon. Faelene helped restore her testimony in the church and she became active again. So Faelene kind of acted like a little bit of a counselor to Hillary. They were friends. It sounded like Faelene reached out to Hillary to cultivate this friendship. She called her all the time. They exchanged letters. During the trial, the prosecution claimed that the phone calls and all of the contact between Hillary and Faelene was actually between Doug and Hillary, that they were still seeing each other behind Faelene's back. But the defense said that these calls were between Hillary and Faelene, and that maybe Doug was involved in some of the conversations, but primarily those two were communicating. 
on Doug's cell phone though, so who knows? Soon after Faileen and Doug were remarried, Faileen started talking to Hillary about becoming the children's mother when she died. Because remember, Faileen believed she was going to die soon. She didn't think that she had much time left and she really wanted her children to be taken care of, which is completely understandable. She felt Hillary would be an amazing mother to her children and trusted her. At the same time, Faileen was writing in her journal about her premonition or prediction, prophecy, whatever you call it. She actually started planning her funeral in detail. She was serious about believing she was going to die. She talked about the fact that she would be able to help her loved ones, including her children, once she left Earth, and that she was planning on waiting for Doug and Hillary in the Celestial Kingdom. During an interview with 48 Hours or 2020 or Investigation, I don't know because they all re-air each other's programs, but during an interview, the journalist asked Hillary what she thought Faileen meant and what she thought Faileen believed and Hillary said, I think she saw us all as a family. I think she did. I think she saw us as, you know, an eternal family. Now, this might seem weird to a lot of you because it's basically polygamy, right? And didn't the Mormon church stop practicing polygamy? Wasn't that the whole reason for all of the offshoots? And what's going on with that? I thought they didn't practice it. Well, not on earth. According to Mormon doctrine, polygamy will still be practiced in the celestial kingdom. It is something that will, I believe, only be practiced in there because that is the only place you can be a forever family is in that kingdom. And if you have been married in this life, when you die and go to the celestial kingdom, like most Mormons believe, it, I find it a little bit funny because they seem to all be quite sure they're going to go to the celestial kingdom. Anyway, so if you go to the celestial kingdom, which means you have taken vows here on earth. You've gone through all of the covenants of the temple. You are sealed in the temple. You wind up in the celestial kingdom. And at some point, God's like, hey, time for you to get a few more wives. And you, as a wife, apparently completely accept this and then just go sit on a cloud and spit out spirit babies. Now, a lot of uh, members of the Mormon church will say that anybody can experience this, but in the scriptures, it does say that you are only entitled to this eternal family and running your own kingdoms on different worlds, stuff like that, you know, all stuff that they deny now, that is only available to people who are sealed in an eternal family. So you can't like die, then go to the celestial kingdom, which has been taught more recently. The scriptures actually say that you have to be sealed on earth in order to obtain exaltation. Exaltation is just another word for godhood. On September 5th, 2001, Faileen wrote the following in her journal. It just touched me that this is another reason I must have faith in Doug's vision. He dreams it every night now that I will get to the celestial kingdom because this is where baby Nicole is in the pre-existence. Now, this is significant to me because the prosecution used this as evidence that Doug was the puppet master and that it was actually him that was manipulating Faileen into believing that she was going to die soon and that this vision that he was supposedly having was kind of urging her like, hey, you'll go to the Celestial Kingdom if you just die already. I read it differently. The way I read it was that maybe she was talking about dying, but she was unsure if she was going to the celestial kingdom and Doug was trying to reassure her. Where this would make sense is if she had a history of expressing desire to take her own life and she did write it in her journal. She did have somewhat of a history. I don't know how extensive it was, but she had written in her journal more than once that she didn't want to be on this earth anymore. Now in the Mormon religion, it is taught now that suicide is a grievous sin, but that you won't be judged on that action alone. So even though it's a sin, God will take it into account. And that doesn't mean that you won't go to the celestial kingdom. Typically for people my age and older, we were taught that it was basically like committing murder. I don't know if that was a scare tactic given the suicide rates in Utah and among Mormons. And they were like, if we just scare the shit out of them. They won't keep doing that. But it clearly didn't work because our suicide rates are fucking ridiculous. So I think that's why it was Elder Ballard that came out and tried to assure people that suicide does not automatically mean that you are going to hell or the celestial kingdom is what it would be. So that's actually the way I took it, but that's only if she were struggling with those thoughts. Her family mentioned when they were asked about her past journal entries where she discussed taking her own life, they said she never would have done it because the church taught against that. So I think they believed that 
older teaching, which taught that it was next to murder and that you were not going to go to the celestial kingdom if you did take your own life. The other thing I found interesting is that Baleen talked about the celestial kingdom being equivalent to the pre-existence. In fact, almost as if they were one. And this is not the case in Mormon theology. The pre-existence is something completely different. And that is where we are before we are born. We are born to Heavenly Mother and Heavenly Father as spirit children. Before that, we are intelligences, which basically means just our essence is floating around the universe, I guess. So you have your pre-existence, which I guess is near Kolob, the star that God lives near, which has typically been interpreted as the planet God lives on. But when I looked back at the scriptures recently, I was like, oh, it doesn't exactly say that. But it does say men will inherit their own planets, just so you know. So your pre-existence is before you come to earth. Then after you die, you go to the spirit world or spirit prison, depending on how you did in life and if you're a member of the church. I did a previous video where I talk more about this because I know if you're not familiar with the Mormon plan of salvation or the beliefs surrounding the afterlife, you're likely to be extremely confused. Anyway, the celestial kingdom does not yet exist. According to the beliefs, the earth will turn into the celestial kingdom eventually. So right now it's called a tila. You know what? I'm getting way too into it. All you really need to know is that they're not the same thing, which I found a little bit interesting, and that the Celestial Kingdom isn't even here yet. Baby Nicole is actually the baby girl that Phelan said that Doug and Hillary would have after she left this earth. She told Hillary that they would be together as husband and wife after she was gone and that they would eventually have a baby girl named Nicole. In fact, she planned when she was making her elaborate funeral plans in her journal, her desire, and she mentioned this in the journal and in the letters that she wrote to them that she wanted to see Hillary and Doug as husband and wife at her funeral. She wanted them to get married immediately after her death. She wanted Doug to almost like introduce Hillary as his new wife at her funeral. I'm like, No, I don't think you can dispute that Faelene believed not only that she was going to pass away imminently, but that Doug and Hillary were meant to be together. Again, the prosecution would say that she only felt that way because Doug was manipulating her that entire time. If you go back in history, Faelene wrote about these things in her journal even before she met Doug or when they were together the first time. And she, of course, was talking about her death and writing about it while her and Doug were apart. So I don't see necessarily where he would have completely manipulated her, but he could have, right? They could have gotten back together. And according to the prosecution's theory, this could have been his tactic. The prosecution definitely made her look like she was just the type of woman that would just go along with her husband and that she was easily manipulated. Faileen also wrote in her journal, I am choosing to give up the life I have that is perfectly the way I want it. I finally have a husband who treats me with love and respect that is even beyond what I could dream of. In the days just before her death, Faileen wrote farewell letters to several members of her family and friends. So she was definitely thinking it was going to be any minute. In these letters, Faileen also wrote, I've had the knowledge given to me that my time on earth is very short. Well, girl, this is it. My last letter since I don't think they have mail delivery from where I'm going. I do know we'll still be together in the spirit and that comforts me. I also know the time will pass quickly and then we'll all be together. On September September 18th, just a week or so before her death, Faileen wrote a letter to Hillary. In that letter, she explained that she was happy to hear Hillary had started dating someone else. But then later, she goes on to talk about the fact that maybe you're not supposed to be with this guy. And it seems like she really was trying to convince Hillary to consider getting back together with Doug as soon as she was gone. Dear Hillary, it's 5.30 a.m. Tuesday, September 18th. It's just one day after you told me you were dating someone. I felt so good as I listened to your feelings. At first, I just felt how much easier your life would be and how normal it would be. I was so proud of you for having the courage to follow your heart and to choose someone who was good for you. I was so happy to hear you saying how you felt despite anything anyone else thinks or feels. I could see you putting Heavenly Father first and it gave me a perfect knowledge that all in your life would fall into place or fall out all according to Heavenly Father's will. I felt peace and left everything in Heavenly Father's hands. Later that day, I felt a deep impression that perhaps whoever this guy is that you are dating is like Lance was for me. The person Heavenly Father gave me to keep me from settling or getting around and spending time with less worthy and inspiring guys. Lance was someone who showed great respect for me and reminded me of who I really am and how I deserve to be treated. Ultimately, it was 
not Heavenly Father's will for me to actually be with Lance, but all of my time with him prepared me to be with Doug once Doug could love and respect me the way he does now, which is greater than I could have ever imagined. Hillary, only you can know between Heavenly Father and yourself if it is Heavenly Father's will for you to be with Doug and to be a great part of our eternal family. I will always feel you as a great part of me, no matter what you choose. I have such a deep love and respect for you and the person you are at such a young age. I know you have great blessings ahead of you. I want you to be the mother of my children. I want you to teach them how precious each of our Heavenly Father's children is and remind them that they are not only precious to Heavenly Father and to their earthly parents, but to their mother who has been physically called to serve her mission elsewhere, but who in spirit is still with them and praying for their ability to have the strength to know and fulfill their own missions upon the earth. I want you to teach them to be true to their real selves by putting their Heavenly Father above all men and even his will above their own desires until his will becomes their will. Most of all though, I want you to do these things only if you feel it is Heavenly Father's plan for you and that in doing these things, you will be being true to him and to yourself. I can promise you that you will have special trials if you accept this calling. I can also promise you that if it is Heavenly Father's will, you will receive special blessings and that I will do all I'm allowed to do to support you from the other side. You would have my full support in spirit. I have no advice for you except to just be your sweet, beautiful self, never fearing the ignorance of man, but seeking only to glorify our Heavenly Father. I trust you as I know he does. I know Doug loves you. I know why and the special person he sees, I see and love also. No matter who Doug marries, I pray that there will never enter into her heart a feeling of first and second wife or a spirit of competition. We are to love one another as the Savior has loved us. There is no place for jealousy and it is impossible to be better or worse than anyone else, no matter how hard we may waste time trying. Of course, this is not our reason for being here, to lift ourselves above or place ourselves below others. Our whole purpose is to become like our brother, Jesus Christ, and through his gifts of forgiveness and repentance, help those around us to do the same. I feel such peace that you would know of my respect for you and know of my desire to be equal partners playing different roles in the lives of our human family. I feel a oneness with you as I see your desire to serve our Heavenly Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. No matter what, I know above all else how much I love and admire you and wish for your happiness. I pray Heavenly Father will bless you with all good things, with beauty, love, faith, hope, and peace. Love always and forever, Faylene. On September 23rd, 2001, just a few days before her death, Faylene wrote another letter. She wrote this letter while she and Doug were on their second honeymoon. They had decided to go to Nauvoo, Illinois, which is very special to Mormons. And there is a lot of history regarding the LDS Church and its origination. In this letter, Faylene wrote, I know I will be here with my body until it is buried. I've had a secret hope and desire for several weeks to see you both married so that I could be there. For some reason, the desire to see you sitting together as husband and wife that my funeral has been so strong. I pray your home will be protected from the adversary and filled with the Holy Ghost. Faylene and Doug were only in Nauvoo for a day when she told Doug that she wanted to go to Utah and visit Mount Tibinokas in, um, I believe it's American Fork Canyon. There are so many canyons to keep track of. It is a common tourist attraction. There are beautiful trails. There is the Timpanogos Cave that a lot of people like to go visit. Doug agreed and they left Nauvoo and flew to Salt Lake City the next day. So so on September 24th, Doug and Faylene were hiking on Mount Tibinogos. During their hike, Doug sat down. Faylene was standing near the edge. Doug later said that he was a little uncomfortable because she kept edging closer and closer to the edge. Doug started to realize she was getting way too close to the edge. He claims that he reached out to her. Her knee buckled. She slipped and fell 60 feet. Luckily, she landed in a pine tree. Doug was horrified, of course. He just saw his wife tumble over this sheer cliff and began running down the path. A lot of the hike to Timpanogos Cave is paved, but there are some real hairy parts. At first, I was like, how did she fall? Especially on accident. The trail is paved. There are signs everywhere. There are guardrails, although I don't think they were necessarily there when she fell back in 2001. But it's a pretty popular trail. There are rangers on it. There are a lot of people on it, typically. Falls off of that trail don't happen often. As Doug ran down the path, he was 
sure that Feline was dead. He did not imagine that she could have survived that fall. As he got to the bottom of the trail, he looked around to find Feline standing up. She was a little dazed. One of her eyes was bleeding and a little like disheveled from falling off a 60 foot cliff, but she was alive and didn't have any broken bones. After her fall, Doug rushed Feline to an emergency room in American Fork. Feline was in the emergency room for about an hour and a half, treated and released. Now, the doctor would later testify that he was suspicious that she actually fell that far because she was relatively uninjured. At first, I was like, I don't even know how you would survive a fall like that. But then I was reading an article that said an 11-year-old girl had fallen off a 100-foot cliff at Timpanogos and had lived. So it's definitely possible to fall that far and live. After Doug and Phelan left the ER, they drove over to a friend's house where they stayed for the next few days while Phelan recovered. Later, the friend said that she had talked to Phelan about her fall and Phelan just said it was almost like an out-of-body experience. During this time, Tammy, Doug's sister, went to check on the house. And as she walked into the bedroom, she was shocked to see... Laid out on the bed were Phelan's temple clothes. You don't lay them out like that, even in your own home. Other things that had notes on them give to Fachi. This chair is for my brother Duggar, you know, just on and on, sticky notes on the mirror. That alone is alarming to walk into someone's bedroom and see that it looks like they have already allocated their belongings. But to see someone's temple clothes laid out in the open on the bed is 10 times more shocking because temple clothing is very sacred to Mormons and it is something that you don't display. You don't take out of the drawer, you only take it out when you're going to the temple, and that's about it. For example, I I once found my mom's temple clothes because she didn't hide them very well. I started to put them on and she came into her bedroom and was horrified. Like you would have thought I ruined our family's entire celestial salvation. So it's understandable that Tammy was completely alarmed. One of Feline's notes mentioned that she was sure she was going to die. Tammy, after she saw this, was so upset that she called her husband. She was terrified that Feline had tried to take her own life after seeing this. She knew about Feline's history of depression. And so for her, this this was a sign that Feline was just not well. Tammy would also later state that it was more than what Feline's family tried to portray, which is just, you know, everybody gets depressed. It wasn't that big of a deal. She wasn't chronically depressed. But according to Tammy and her husband, Doug had tried to get her help several times and she refused that along with being prescribed antidepressants. So I think she was very much in the mindset that she could overcome depression by herself. And to me, when I heard her family talking about it, I kind of feel like she was raised to believe that depression shouldn't be an issue. Like you should be able to just get over it. Like we all know those people. <laughs> There is a journal entry to support this that Faylene wrote. I then tell Doug I need help and how I am feeling and why and that I'm suicidal and that I think of crazy things to do to myself and that I need his help. He says he doesn't know how to help me. I see he isn't feeling what I feel and it kills me. Well, finally Doug grabs me and gets on top of me on the bed and I'm trying to say, leave me alone. You don't love me. I'm just a failure. Should just admit it and quit hurting me. On September 26th, after her fall, Faylene and Doug flew home to Arizona. And according to Doug, Faylene had stopped talking about these visions. She was no longer constantly talking about her impending death. It was almost as if this fall had woken her up and everything was fine. Only everything clearly wasn't fine and wouldn't be fine the following day. When they arrived home, Faylene was in a lot of pain. She couldn't sleep. She was really hurting. And we all know that if you've ever been in an accident and been injured, that it's usually like the second day where you're in more pain than when it initially happens. After seeing how much pain Faylene was in, Doug called a friend, Chad White, who was a physician's assistant that Doug knew well. Chad came by the house and examined Faylene. He prescribed her some Ambien, gave her a shot of Toradol, and then also prescribed some painkillers for her, which I think is pretty typical. In the trial, it was said that as Chad was leaving, he told Doug not to fill the Ambien quite yet, but Doug went out immediately and filled all of the prescriptions. The prosecution would later point to this as a sign of Doug's guilt. In my opinion, depending on the situation that was going on, and it sounds like at that time, Doug's parents were there to keep failing company, I would probably do the same. Just go out, get it filled, and then if for some reason she didn't need it, you at least have it just in case. Faylene went to bed early that evening and around 8 p.m. that night, her 11-year-old daughter, Jenna, came home from a friend's house. Their two younger sons were also there. Doug would later say that he remembered Faylene waking up at one point during the night in a lot of pain, but he didn't remember if she had taken any medication. 
again. A few hours later, he woke up again to see Faline walking toward a bathroom and she told him that she was going to get in the tub. Doug fell asleep apparently right away after this because Doug is kind of clueless. Later, Doug woke up and claims that he saw Faline unconscious in the bathroom. At 7.46 a.m. on the morning of September 27th, Chad White called 911 on his way to Doug and Faline's house. Doug had called him frantic and told him to come over. Chad was kind of puzzled because he didn't understand why Doug didn't call 911 first. And he mentioned this in the 911 call. He also told the operator that he felt like it might be an overdose because Doug had told him over the phone that she had taken all the medication. But he also said that Doug was so frantic that he couldn't necessarily understand him. He later testified that he walked into the bedroom to see Faylene nude on her back on the king size bed, not breathing. Faylene was soaking wet as was everything around her. He felt for a pulse and began CPR. Now Doug also claimed that he had tried to do CPR and that it wasn't working. Chad said that during CPR, Faylene vomited several times and expelled water. Chad also testified that Doug was kneeling next to the bed next to Faylene and he appeared hysterical. Paramedics soon rushed in and they took over. Faylene was rushed to Valley Lutheran Hospital. Both sides of the family rushed to the hospital as soon as they heard the news. Doug's sister Tammy said that Doug was clearly distraught like you would expect. Faylene's family got a different impression. They said that Doug appeared like nervous and jittery and that he wouldn't go hold Faylene's hand. He wouldn't even go near her. And they just felt like something was going on. Faylene continued to deteriorate throughout the day. And at 4.37 p.m., she was taken off life support and passed away. Jenna, her 11-year-old daughter, would later describe the devastation she felt leaving the hospital after her mother died. And Faylene's sister, Shirlene, would later recall what happened, telling the reporter that Doug took Faylene away. When the reporter questioned her, she said that the family had planned on getting an analysis from the doctor the following day, but that Doug had convinced the nurse to turn off the life support and to stop resuscitative efforts. I thought this was kind of suspicious because I don't think a nurse can do that. I think it's pretty much only a doctor that can call it and that there has to be more involvement in that situation. But that's what Faylene's sister said. When the initial investigator arrived at the scene, he said that nothing appeared out of place or suspicious. It appeared to him that Faylene's death was accidental. And so an investigation wasn't done. Just three weeks after Faylene died in October of 2001, Doug and Hillary were married, which understandably pissed Faylene's family off. I think this was really the first big crack in their relationship with Doug. They may not have really liked him before, but apparently at the funeral, they were sitting together and getting along well. It wasn't until March of 2002, about six months after Faylene's death, that her family began to push for an investigation though. This apparently happened right after her family members who worked for Doug at his company had tried what Doug considered to be a hostile takeover and wanted to force him out of his own company. And this is on a website. I assume it's Doug. It's on a website called thetruthaboutdouggrand.com. I'll link it below if I remember to. So this is his belief or whoever launched the website, their belief. So this hostile takeover didn't work out. Doug retained control of the company. And of course, the relationship with his former in-laws completely unraveled. So shortly after this attempt failed, Faylene's family really did begin pushing for an investigation into her death. Apparently, they were able to push a new narrative so that the investigation could be reopened. And this was due in part to the relationship between Faylene's father and the Gilbert police chief. They were friends and attended church together. In 2002, Glenna Eves talked to Detective Cy Ray, who was assigned to the case after the initial investigator was removed. Glenna, Faylene's mother, told Detective Ray, Faylene told me almost a year ago when Doug and her were splitting up or after the divorce on two different occasions that she wouldn't be here long. And I just laughed it off. You don't believe stuff like that. I just told her, I don't know anyone as good as you, Faye, and you've got these little kids. You're going to be here a long time. And then I just let it go. But she had those feelings, you know. And this is in addition to the letters that she wrote, the farewell letters that she wrote 
to family and friends, even her sister, Shirlene, who is probably the most critical of Doug. She was definitely, out of all of them, the one that's like, he's insisted that even though Faline had said she wasn't going to live long, that she didn't have premonitions or visions about when it would happen or how soon, which I think conflicts a lot with the later journal entries that were discussed and the farewell letters. And not all of those letters were actually presented to the jury at trial. In fact, the prosecution, particularly Detective Ray with the Gilbert Police Department, did not turn over a lot of those letters and journal entries, which is a little suspicious. But according to Shirlene, all of these strange statements that Faylene made were all because of Doug. Detective Ray would say that there were quotes all over Faylene's Bible and Book of Mormon that if something came from a prophet, it's considered revelation and that you never went against something that the prophet said. It was just not something that you question, which is true. You don't question the prophet. According to the Mormon religion, the current prophet will never lead you astray. If president of the church should ever lead people astray, God would take him away. So I like to stay here and I won't lead you astray. But after that prophet dies, if he says anything that conflicts with the current prophet, It's the current prophet, know what I mean? According to Detective Ray, Doug set himself up as Faylene's prophet. And I completely disagree with this idea. To me, there is no indication that Doug manipulated Faylene into thinking he was a prophet. I just find it hard to believe people who later admit that they hide a bunch of evidence that is favorable to the defendant. So I call bullshit on Detective Ray, basically. Not saying he's a liar, just saying I'm calling bullshit on his statements because it certainly doesn't look very flattering when you are asserting things that aren't actually fact and when you tell two grand juries things that mm, aren't necessarily true but will get you an indictment for murder. Just my opinion, just the way I feel. As far as I'm concerned, Faylene's journals, her farewell letters, her other letters, her family really downplayed them. In fact, they told the defense during the trial that they no longer had the farewell letters that the defense wanted, which I find hard to believe. Who loses a letter that a loved one gives you right before their death? I don't buy that. But according to them, they didn't even have those letters. And these things that Faylene wrote were not what they appeared to be. The thing is, though, that Mormons, we have our own code. We have certain words that other people don't use. You know, I received an impression, which is pretty much saying the Holy Ghost told me. I was told typically means that that's coming from God, Jesus, through the Holy Ghost. A witness. We kind of know what that is. I don't think Mormons actually realize how spiritual they are and how strange they sound until things like this happen. We've seen that with the Daybell case. Obviously, Lori got away with a lot of shit because people didn't find it strange enough for it to raise red flags. The same with Chad. Mormons hear these things all the time. They read these types of things all the time. And so it doesn't appear to be strange until there's a court case and the rest of the world reads it and says, that's a little odd. And then there's this attempt to say, well, no, you're misconstruing that. That's not what it is. But as someone that was a lifelong member of the church until I was 35, I can assure you this is not extreme for Mormon women to make these statements, for Mormons to believe that they are told certain things in the temple. I felt like her family definitely was trying to distance these statements from Faylene. This became quite clear to me after I listened to Faylene's sister when she was asked about a journal entry in which Faileen said, I felt like I should just drive off a cliff, quit wasting space and air on this planet. Faileen's sister Jody said, who in their life hasn't at least once thought, you know, life would be easier if just, you know, drove my car off a cliff? It's just a figure of speech. Can someone tell me why Mormon women talk about driving off cliffs so much? I know three people specifically in my own life that talked about driving off cliffs, a couple with their kids. Lori Dable talked about driving off a cliff with her kids. Faylene talked about driving off a cliff. What is this obsession with cliffs? I don't understand because I don't see it in the scriptures. But I don't, I don't understand it. Is this normal even outside of 
Like, someone explain it to me. In July of 2002, after the investigation into Faleen's death had begun, Doug Grant was questioned for seven hours by Detective Ray. At that time, the motive for Faleen's murder was considered to be the life insurance policy that Faleen had. Her policy was originally $360,000, and in the weeks before her death, Faleen had applied for another $500,000, bringing it to $860,000. However, later it was revealed that even though Faleen had requested the additional amount, that had not gone through. So Doug would not have received that money. Doug and Faleen were pretty wealthy to begin with. So this theory didn't really make much sense to me. Between 2002 and 2005, nothing happened in the case. It pretty much went stale. During this time, Gilbert lost the prescription bottles that had been collected from the scene. This was very important because those prescription bottles were never dusted for prints, which would have either helped or hurt Doug's case. Phone records that included the calls that were between supposedly Doug and Hillary or Faleen and Hillary, according to the defense, also disappeared. I swear to God, that police department is a black hole. In 2005, though, Detective Ray got the break he was waiting for. One of Doug's former friends approached Faleen's family and offered to testify that Doug had confessed to him that he had murdered Faleen. The only thing was he needed $10,000 from them to do that. Apparently, he was trying to start something up. And according to some comments, Faleen's family was on board. They actually asked for a business plan. So this to me is pretty shady. Whose name is Jim, I believe, Alea? Alea? We'll just call him Jimmy. So Jimmy was captured on tape talking to Faleen's sister, Shirlene, and arranging to wear the wire in order to get Doug's confession for the payment of the $10,000. He did visit Doug. Doug didn't confess. In fact, Doug, if anything, sounded even more adamant. He said that he knew that Faleen did not kill herself and that he certainly didn't kill her, which is interesting to me because I think if anything, that would be like an easy explanation for the defense. Like you could just claim like, you know, she did, but Doug was adamant that she did not take her own life. And even in the interviews later, he sounded like he was defending her a lot of the time. You know, he talked about how people saw Faleen as extreme, but she wasn't extreme. She was just very spiritual. He did not want people to believe that she had taken her own life. According to Jimmy, his story was that Doug had confessed to him because he didn't want to pay $2,700 a month in child support and alimony. And so it would be just easier to get rid of Faleen. On the same recording, Doug was heard saying, if you believe in your heart that I told you, I put her in the tub and then I put her to sleep, that is basically saying I killed her. That is the most ridiculous thing on the planet. In July of that year, Detective Ray, the only witness, appeared with the prosecutor in front of a grand jury to present evidence regarding Doug's guilt. Testimony from Jim Alaya was really the only information they had along with several statements made by Ray. Detective Ray made a pretty good case in front of the grand jury despite the fact that it was misleading. He talked about the fact that Chad had told Doug, you know, not to fill the Ambien prescription right away, but that it was Doug who brought up the prescription in the first place, leading the jury to believe that it was all Doug's idea to prescribe this Ambien. Now, later during the trial, Chad White would testify and say, no, it was my idea to prescribe her the Ambien because she couldn't sleep. I told them to try the Soma first that he had prescribed. And if the Soma didn't work, to try the Ambien, but to contact me before that. Obviously, that wasn't done because it was Ambien that was found in Faleen's system. I think the biggest strength that Detective Ray had going for him was the fact that Doug and Hillary got married three weeks after Faleen was buried, which I agree, that does not look great. Ray claimed that his star witness, really the thing that this case hinged on, had a confession from Doug Grant. While he mentioned two journal entries, he didn't say anything about farewell letters or really anything about those entries at all while he was presenting the evidence. Because of course, that's not really the evidence you want to provide when you're trying to get an indictment from a grand jury. He also insinuated that Doug had possibly been the one to either convince Faleen to jump off the cliff or that he had pushed her. According to Detective Ray, Doug didn't want her to be alone. He was strangely protective of her. She wouldn't talk to people. So he tried to imply that this was possibly a domestic violence situation. Detective Ray never mentioned her prophecies or her beliefs because in his mind, it was Doug that convinced Faleen to have these visions, dreams, or whatever. Doug, according to Detective Ray, was a puppet master. Another thing that was very damaging to the defense 
evidence was the fact that Doug and Hillary met in the park the night of Phelan's death, which is questionable. A witness, one of Hillary's friends, said that Hillary had told her Doug had grabbed her hips during this meeting and told her how much he missed them after giving her some cash and telling her that her life was going to change now that Phelan was gone. Doug did give Hillary money, but he also gave her a letter that Phelan had written. The grand jury sent the indictment 13 to 0 for first-degree murder for Doug Ground. In 2006, the prosecution star witness, Jim Alaya, whatever his name is, he did recant his entire testimony. He said, you know, dude's an asshole, but he never confessed to me. I was like, he's not the only asshole. According to him, he was taken down to the station by Detective Ray after Ray was tipped off. Detective Ray coerced him and pushed him to wear a wire to get this confession from Doug. In 2006, the case was being heard by Judge Talamante with the Arizona Superior Court, and he actually returned the case to another grand jury because he didn't feel like there was enough evidence. I guess this is something that is rarely done. So the case was returned to the grand jury. The second grand jury also indicted Doug for first-degree murder based on the testimony of Detective Ray. Doug was being painted as a sex addict who would rather be with Hillary because she would wear thong underwear and Phelan just wouldn't wear them. So the narrative changed from money to sex being the motive. The prosecutor in this case was Juan Martinez. And if you followed the Jody Arias case, he is the same prosecutor. He is very much known for being a viper. And a few years later after Doug's case, he was actually disbarred because of prosecutorial misconduct, like hiding evidence and shit. So he wasn't the most ethical guy, which is totally surprising for Arias. Arizona. In 2007, Mel McDonald took over for the defense in the case, and he found witnesses that had never been interviewed. And he also put doubt into this story that was given regarding Jenna seeing Doug in the kitchen the morning of Phelan's death. Jenna had said that she was in the kitchen about 7.15 and that Doug was making her brother's breakfast before telling her to take them over to a neighbor's house. A neighbor later testified that Doug had sent her over with the boys, but that the boys were hungry, like they hadn't eaten breakfast. And that after Jenna and the boys came over, she ran over to Doug and Phelan's house and found Doug to be quite hysterical and not at all the way that the prosecution portrayed him to be. Finally, the trial began in 2008. It was a shit show pretty big shit show. The most damning thing of all of the evidence that the prosecution entered, in my opinion, is the testimony of Jenna. It had been seven years since her mother's death. Jenna was now testifying that the morning of Phelan's murder, she had gone to the bedroom and tried to open the door, but it was locked and she had tried to jiggle the lock. And then she said she heard sounds of what she felt like was her mother being drowned by Doug. There was no way for the defense to look at the toxicology or tissue sound or blood at that point to either refute that or confirm that because the lab had destroyed everything. Apparently, the prosecution had never flagged the samples, letting the lab know that the death was suspicious, although that they had convinced the medical examiner to change the cause of death from accidental to undetermined when they decided they wanted to reopen the investigation or open the investigation, really, I guess, because it was never opened. So when they opened the investigation, according to the medical examiner who testified, the lab typically holds these samples for about five years. Not once was the lab ever contacted by the police and told to hold on to these items because this death was being investigated. So in 2006, those tissue samples, blood samples, all of the toxicology was destroyed by the lab. So the prosecution had Jenna as their major witness. They also had the meeting in the park between Hillary and Doug, which does look suspicious. And they also very much focused on the 911 call made the morning of Phelan's death. There was only one article I read that said actually what had happened is the 911 system was down that morning when Doug tried to call it. He called another number, like another emergency number, before calling Chad White. The reason why he called Chad White was because he couldn't get through to 911 in his area. The problem is records were lost, either proving or disproving that. And one juror after they rendered the verdict said that that was really the big issue in the case is that Doug didn't call 911. 
And so they felt that they couldn't return a not guilty verdict because of that. While the prosecution stuck with the relationship between Doug and Hillary, Jenna's testimony, and the 911 call with Chad White, the defense focused more on Phelan's state of mind. The journal entries, the statements she made to family and friends, the farewell letters, which they weren't able to get. Many of these items had been withheld from them, but they still had a lot to show that Phelan definitely believed her own death was near and at times appeared to have suicidal thoughts or ideations. But again, the prosecution's argument was that all of these were influenced by Doug, despite the fact that a lot of these writings were in years past. During the trial, the extent of Detective Ray's misconduct, in my opinion, was revealed. It was discovered that he had kept information from the defense, the grand juries, and the prosecution. He tainted many of the witnesses by pushing his theories, ultimately influencing their testimony. He coerced the star witness, who later recanted testimony. He suppressed some of Phelan's writings. It's very clear, no matter how you see this case, that Detective Ray definitely did not want the jury to see anything favorable at all to Doug. So the accusation regarding the relationship between Phelan's family, who was said to be influential in the community, the police chief, the reopening of the investigation shortly after they parted ways with Doug on not very good terms, that kind of says some things to me. Shortly before the trial ended, possibly sensing that the case wasn't going the way they wanted, the prosecution told the jury that they didn't have to render a first degree murder verdict. They could go for a second degree manslaughter or even assisted suicide. No physical evidence had been linked to Doug. The only evidence linked to Doug was purely circumstantial. The prescription that he had run out to get filled, the relationship with Hillary. So they didn't have anything that really linked him to her death. So after 14 days of deliberation, the jury finally did render their verdict and they found Doug guilty of manslaughter. While Doug was in prison serving a five-year sentence, Phelan's family filed a multi-million dollar lawsuit. The judge in this lawsuit allowed evidence that was inadmissible in the criminal trial. According to the judge, it was highly unlikely that Doug had murdered Phelan and therefore he wasn't going to award any punitive damages. In 2011, Jenna filed a lawsuit preventing Doug from earning any type of royalties off of a future book. I don't know. The lack of physical evidence to me is very concerning. I can't help but wonder as far as motives and statements. It was very apparent to me that Faileen believed that her death was imminent. I'm not sure if she was planning on taking her own life. People can have those thoughts and those thoughts can change. So I don't think it's fair to say that she was and that this was a suicide. If anything, maybe it was some recklessness. Maybe it was wanting to fulfill a self-fulfilling prophecy and it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision. Likewise, Doug, I don't know. Faileen's brother mentioned at one point that Doug could turn on the waterworks whenever he wanted to because, you know, he was this entrepreneur and so he would get on stage and have these tragic stories that he would tell and he could just turn on the tears. And I can kind of see that during the interviews that I watched. He definitely appeared to have waterworks going fairly easily. That doesn't mean that he wasn't emotional. I mean, I know men who are very emotional, so I don't think that points to necessarily his guilt, but it is something I took a little note of. Other reports mentioned the fact that they didn't feel like Hillary was emotional enough, and I felt like that at the beginning too, but then I realized how red her eyes were, how stuffy her nose was, and then you did see tears later in that interview, so I do think that her emotions were genuine. I do believe that Faileen and Hillary had a genuine friendship. I think that Faileen Aileen really wanted her children to be taken care of and that she felt Hillary was the best person to do that. I think Faileen believed with all her heart that she was going to die, whether she made the decision or not. I don't know when it comes to this case. I can see it going either way. We don't have any physical evidence. You know, none of the samples were testable. They disappeared. Like who, if you're investigating a suspicious death, isn't that one of the first phone calls you would make? Like hold that 
tissue sample hold that blood work because I'm investigating this. That doesn't make any sense that for five years, Gilbert police, as they're investigating a case, just wouldn't think to call the medical examiner's office or the lab. So weird. Oopsies. Like that's a big oopsies. One of the biggest red flags is the missing journal entries, the missing farewell letters. I can also see that say you're in that situation and you know for sure this guy is guilty. You also know that these letters don't exactly make him look as guilty and that if they are entered into evidence, there's a chance he could get off scot-free. That's a pretty big motivation to not necessarily being forthcoming. I can definitely understand that and empathize with that. That would be a really hard decision for me to make. To tell you the truth, you can't ignore the behavior of the prosecution and Detective Syre, who, by the way, was promoted to sergeant for his work solving the case, which I don't think he did, but go ahead and pat yourself on the back, kiddo. I want to hear what you guys think, though. Me, personally, at the very least, I do agree with the manslaughter conviction only because I think if there really were all of these warning signs, the fact that he fell asleep knowing his wife had taken powerful medications and was about to draw a bath is like just kind of dumb. I understand being tired. I once fell asleep breastfeeding one of my children and I woke up and that poor kid that I mean just all over the bed. <laughs> like, poor thing. Luckily, he was fine. Very full. I almost wonder if it was a situation where he was just letting it happen, where they had talked about it so many times that he didn't try and prevent it because he was like, oh, I guess that's what's supposed to happen. You know what I mean? I could go either way on this particular case, but it is eerily reminiscent of Tammy Daybell's alleged murder. Thank you for visiting me today and listening to me ramble and remember who you are and what you stand for. If I could say something to Dad, I would tell him that my mom's not gonna be at my wedding. My mom hasn't been able to meet my first boyfriend. She's never gonna be able to see her grandchildren. I still have dreams about her and I still feel her with me. I see evidence of her, her workings in, in my life. Mm -hmm.